Laura, would you please kick off our very long awaited webinar for the evening? Terrific, I'm so happy to do so. Uh, hello from Florida, my name is Laura Abrams and I am the Leadership Development Director for American Friends of the Hebrew University. I also have the distinct pleasure of knowing and getting to work with the wonderful press, Professor Kobe Nachmias, who is a wonderful innovator, researcher, friend, professor, and um, just all around good guy. So I have the pleasure of introducing him and I will also hopefully at the end of this program, my grandmother-in-law, Rena Frankel, who has also a terrific relationship with Professor Nachmias, close out the program. So Professor Kobe Nachmias is a director of the Alexander Grass Center for Bioengineering at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And he is the CSO of Future Meat Technologies and Tissue Dynamics. As a bioengineer and innovator, his breakthroughs range from the first 3D printing of cells to the first commercial human on a chip technology. He is also the co-founding director of Biodesign Israel, an entrepreneurship that has educated over 120 fellows spinning off multiple startups. For tissue Dynamics is developing groundbreaking human on a chip instruments for drug development and the Future Meat Technologies focuses on the cost-effective production of cultured meat. Professor Nakamis' research at the Hebrew University focuses on the development of nanotechnology-based diagnostic devices, innovative medical techniques, advanced computational models, and microchip alternatives for animal and human testing. He has degrees in chemical engineering from Technion Israel, bioengineering from the University of Minnesota and is a visiting professor at Harvard Medical School and a former visiting professor at the Broad Institute of MIT. We are so pleased to have him speak with us here today about his latest developments. Thank you. And I would like to jump in just before Kobe begins to say that we have listening to us tonight people from over 20 countries and this is thrilling for us to have such a worldwide family of the Hebrew University. And welcome to everyone. And now. One second. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. One second. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Laura gave a wonderful, heartfelt introduction, and she's probably, you know, I I hope she's she's feeling bad about the about the fact that she's not in Jerusalem right now. She was supposed to be here this summer uh, with her husband and her kids. So. Uh, I guess, you know, COVID-19 changed everything. And this is part of the reason we're here today uh, to talk about, to talk about COVID-19. So let me start by sharing my slides. And uh, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to add them to the, uh, add them to the chat box. I should be able to see it. Here we go. Wonderful. So, COVID-19 uh, metabolism um, and your lungs. Why should you care um, and, uh, and what can we do about it? So, I think I want to start by, you know, a general introduction to, to viruses, what they're made of, you know, what size are they, what, you know, what's unique about this virus and, and move slightly uh, uh, deeper. I hope I'm not going to lose anybody uh, during this uh, talk. I've tried to keep it both, you know, uh, general and also trying to have a little bit more information for people who want to be a little bit, deep, a little bit deeper into this. Let's see. Okay. So size does seem to matter in biology. Uh, we have, one second. Okay. Size does seem to happen to matter in biology. When we're talking about, uh, uh, one second, I have a problem here. This is uh, my fault. Why don't we move this? Okay. 
So when we talk about us, right, everything that there is around us is, is usually, we are about one and a half, two meters tall. Um, some of us are taller than others. Usually the objects that we're dealing with in everyday life are roughly the size of a few centimeters, right? So a mouse is about 10 centimeters in size. And we can see and feel, you know, things down to the insect level, right? Down to one millimeter. We, we know and we see things there. But once things start to be small, smaller than a single millimeter, we have a problem seeing that. But, you know, our story is actually going to start there. And to see at that level, we really need a microscope. And when you use a light microscope, you know, you use lenses, uh, you can actually see that we are composed of cells. Uh, all of our bodies are composed of uh, uh, you know, these basic building blocks like Legos, right? There are membranes and inside they have a nucleus where all the genetic material is found. There are about 10 microns in diameter. That means 10, one millionth of a meter. Um, and they are, they're essentially everywhere. This is our lung cells, this is our blood cells. If you go below that, we're in the realm of bacteria. And we can also see bacteria in a, in a light microscope. It's a little hard. They look like, you know, a, a single black spot. But these are the bacteria, right? So this is things like Salmonella or E. coli, right? Uh, when we're talking about viruses, we are talking about things that are down to uh, nanometer size. And to see them, we actually have to, we actually have to go uh, and use an electron microscope. And, and when you look at an electron microscope, you can actually see bacteria now look a lot bigger. They have a little, a little bit more things in them. You can actually see the membranes and the genetic material floating around. When you look at viruses, well, viruses are about 100 nanometers in size. That means they're not a hell of a lot bigger than a single protein. Um, there are essentially a box, a box that has a little bit of genetic material. It doesn't have the capability of dividing by itself. Viruses cannot make other viruses. Um, they're just floating around. And this is the, the new coronavirus. This is the things that put, you know, half of the world population into quarantine and killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people up till now. Uh, this is how they look like. And, and if you see those spike proteins surrounding this, this protein shell, this is why they're called coronaviruses. This is essentially the crown of protein that surrounds them. And the schematic of how this virus looks like is, is here on the left. So the, the things here, the spikes are, are the... Uh, are the uh, uh, these things that appear here in orange, these are actually the fingers of the virus. It can't move them. They're, you know, they're stuck, um, but it uses them to essentially attach to surfaces, attach to proteins. And then there is a shell, and inside the shell, there is this genetic material. And in this case, it's a single strand of positive RNA. Okay, that's it. So it's a box with a few proteins on top and a single strand of RNA. So when we were taught in high school about viruses, we were probably taught something like this, right? If, if you studied biology, this is what you were taught. You know, we have a cell in our body. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. We have a cell in our body. It has a DNA. Then it has these nasty viruses floating around. The virus gets into the cell, you know, breaks open. The genetic material goes into the cell and then the cells well, they start making more viruses. At some point, there are so many viruses that the cell blows up and sends all these nasty viruses to infect other cells, right? So this is what we, this is what we, we, we were taught. And, and indeed, there are viruses that behave this way. Um, but, and, and, and if this is actually what happens, you have this rupture of cells, and it makes sense that you'll have this massive amount of damage, right? Every time a virus gets into a cell, your cell would blow up. So you expect to see necrosis, you expect to see inflammation, you expect to see a massive amount of death everywhere. Um, but honestly, this is not how the majority of viruses that we have problems work. Um, 
You know, coronavirus is a case in point. Uh, the virus goes into the cell, um, replicates inside the cell, causes the cell to essentially make new viruses, which are then slowly released out of the cell without blowing up anything, right? So this is the virus we descri I've described to you before. It's, it's sitting right here. It's spike proteins actually bind the ACE2 receptor. Um, there was a question about ACE inhibitors and I'll be happy to answer this later if you want. Um, using this receptor, it goes into the cell and then it bursts out of this uh, endosome. It bursts in releasing its genetic material, its single strand of RNA that single strand of RNA becomes a polyprotein. That means a very long piece chunk of protein. And this chunk of protein is cleaved by different enzymes to make other different proteins that now start running around the cell, um, taking RNA, making more RNA, making more virus particles, and then package these virus particles on a piece of membrane that used to be part of our membranes used to be a Golgi, so, but now it's a virus replication complex. So there's this factory of membranes that is made in the cell, and then viruses are created in this factory and slowly released out to the bloodstream or to the mucus, okay? What happened to the cell? Nothing. The virus got in, it replicated, it makes a lot of new viruses, and then it gets out and nothing really happens to our cells. And if you think about it, that's actually what happens with many of the coronaviruses. You know, the vast majority of the coronaviruses that, are, that, we, that we see um, cause, well, mild disease at best, right? It's, it's essentially causes, it's one of the causes of the common cold. You have a little bit of fever, you have a little sore throat, and after, you know, a few days or a week, you clear the virus out of the system. You know, when we look at the genetics of this virus, you know, we think coronaviruses emerged over 10,000 years ago. And a specific family of the coronavirus that we're dealing with right now, this better coronavirus, actually appeared, you know, uh, at 3,300 BC. So, you know, a little bit, a little bit over 5,000 years ago, more or less. Nobody's really counting. And... We don't really know where these viruses originate from, but because, there is, but because they appear a lot in bats, we think that bats and maybe even rodents are probably some of the earlier carriers of this disease. So we're talking about wild animals, but viruses from these wild animals tend to jump and infect domesticated animals. So everything from pigs to camels to, to cattle to cows. Um, we, we know this from also from influenza, right? Influenza also jumps from uh, wild animals to domesticated animals. For example, we have avian influenza or pig influenza. Now, the viruses that we see in this family, well, some of them don't really have a, a, a very severe disease. Um, HCOV OC43 and HQU1, uh, you know, cause common cold. They are everywhere, they are, you know, everywhere around the world. They are jumping around humans every time there is a little bit of winter. And if you, if you sneeze, uh, um, well, it's either a rhinovirus or a coronavirus or, you know, one of those. Um, there are other strands of viruses, 229E, NL63, also cause very mild disease at best. But once in a while, you know, we have viruses of this particular family that cause, you know, a severe acute respiratory syndrome. So clinically, when we're talking about acute respiratory syndrome, we're talking about the virus that infects both the upper and the lower respiratory, tra respiratory tract. That means you get infection everywhere, um, everywhere, you know, from, from the top to the bottom to the alveoli of, of, your, of your lungs. Um, it can lead to a lot of different things. We'll talk about it later. Uh, we, the first time that we know it happened in, 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 and we tracked it, it was the SARS epidemic, right? The SARS epidemic of 2002 lasted two years. Uh, 
again originated in bats. It's it's called it was called SARS or now it's called SARS-CoV-1. Um, and then about eight years after that ended, we had another epidemic here in the Middle East. It called it was called MERS, uh, the Middle East Respiratory uh, Respiratory Syndrome virus. It's, it was a, again another part of the coronavirus family. This was kind of strange virus. You know, it, it seemed to be popping up every three years. The last time it was 2018. So 2012, 2015, 2018, you know. Um, and then the recent virus, SARS-CoV-2, which causes the COVID-19 pandemic, emerged in November of 2019. And it's very, very similar to, to, the, to the general SARS. So why are some of these viruses cause mild disease and some of them cause severe disease, right? This is like the million dollar question. And, and honestly, we don't know. But, but we know something very, very strange about, well, the SARS and the MERS viruses. But let's talk about the SARS virus. You know, the one that we have a lot of information about because it started 18 years ago and ended about 16 years ago. So we have a lot of information about it. The SARS epidemic erupted in November 2002, mainland China. Uh, the virus had a mortality rate of about 9.6%, so significantly more than the current virus. Uh, but it only caused 8,000 deaths. It caused only 8,000 deaths worldwide because it was controlled. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a pandemic, it was controlled. The problem is that if you look at the data on patients that were infected with the virus and cleared it, right? So they recovered from the disease and they recovered it from the disease, um, well, more than 12 years ago. If, if you look at that population, there was something very, very troubling about it. From the, all the people that were infected with the original SARS virus, right? Not the current one, the original one in 2002, they, they were 44% more likely to suffer from abnormal fat and hyperglycemia. So some of them had high cholesterol, some of them had too high of glucose levels. So essentially early onset diabetes. Uh, they were 40% more likely to suffer from cardiac disease even though they cleared the virus. Yeah, they cleared the virus 12 years ago, but they still over these 12 years, something changed. You know, they were more likely to have cardiac disease. And in a more general sense, they were 46% more likely to be hospitalized with some sort of an illness. So something changed in their bodies and it seems to be related to, to metabolism. By the way, one of the things that is very, very difficult in Zoom is to understand if people can still hear me. Uh, so somebody needs to give me a sign of life. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. So everybody raise their hands. So all these risk factors, all these metabolic signatures are not unique to, to the original SARS. We see something very, very similar with COVID-19. So what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is the disease. COVID-19 is the disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, severe cases of this disease are defined by acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome. Uh, we don't know what causes it. We know that we're essentially what the patients are experiencing is a cytokine storm. Essentially, the immune system in the body goes nuts. Something happens, even though the virus does not kill the cells, something happens and the immune system starts releasing all these cytokines, all these inflammatory cytokines everywhere, causing damage. So the immune system causes damage to our own lungs. And once you have this damage, then you can get sepsis, essentially bacteria starts growing in your lungs and you get from sepsis, you can go into shock, you can get blood clots, that's the disease, that's what people, that's what people are dying from. Uh, 
when the CDC has looked at risk factors um, just now, August 2020, a lot of things that are relating to metabolism start emerging. And by the way, we saw that from early reports of the disease back in China. So one, we, we know that not all the people that are infected with the virus are going to develop this disease. Actually, 80% are going to be completely asymptomatic. And lack of symptoms means you don't have COVID-19. Out of the 20% that remains, you know, a significant part of them is, are, not, are not going to need to, to be hospitalized. That means their symptoms are going to be so mild that they're going to stay at home. Okay? Um, then there is about 5% more or less. We don't really know the statistics. It change, seems to change from different country to different country. But about 5% will need to be hospitalized. And it seems like there are risk factors associated with who is going to be hospitalized. So who is actually going to be developing a disease? Um, obese patients, essentially morbidly obese, are 450%, four times more likely to be hospitalized due to COVID-19. Well, that makes sense, right? Obese patients are usually more inflammatory. Um, and, and, uh, an obscene amount of fat will essentially cause the immune system to be constantly active. So that's not going to be good. Um, but we're seeing other things. We're seeing that people with dyslipidemia, people that have high cholesterol, are three times more likely to be hospitalized. And the same is true for people with hyperglycemia, people with you know, uncontrolled diabetes three times more likely to be hospitalized. This is very strange. What's the, what's the problem with dyslipidemia? Why would high cholesterol affect the virus? Why would high cholesterol or high glucose affect the immune system? And this is strange because when you look at people with asthma, they're only 150% more likely to be hospitalized. And asthma is an inflammatory disease of the lungs. Why would metabolic signature be so much more important than, you know, an inflammatory disease in the lungs? So something is interesting here, and it seems to be related to metabolism. There are long-lasting effects of COVID-19, and this is from a review paper. I just realized that the reference is not here. It's a review paper that appeared in Cell Metabolism uh, just last month. So... People that recover from COVID-19 have very similar problems to people that recovered from SARS. That means, right, these people clear the virus. They, don't, they no, long, no longer have a virus, right? They cleared it. They're out of the hospital. They're at home. Um, it seems like insulin sensitivity is dysregulated. They, become, they might become more hyperglycemic. They might, it might, they might be pre-diabetic or diabetic. Some people actually show diabetes after infection. They seem to be elevated levels of fatty acids and triglycerides, essentially dyslipidemia. Even if you didn't have it before you went to the hospital, you're going to have it after you left the hospital. And there seems to be some sort of an impaired sense of satiety and hunger. So some people might eat more. Now, it's not the only effect. There's muscle wasting. There's a lot of other effects. There's, there's issues with the pancreas and, and other things, but, um, but we don't really know. It seems like there is a lot of metabolic side effects. So I see that a lot of very specific questions I'm getting. Um, how do we know that the coronavirus appeared around 3,300 BCE? Um, this is the beta coronavirus, and, and by looking at the genes of the virus, essentially it's genetic signature, and trying to track down mutations, assuming that mutations are random, you can try to do something like carbon dating on a virus. Um, what range of hyperglycemia makes patients more likely to be hospitalized? We don't really know. Uh, you know, some of this data is retrospective. By the way, I see that there is Avner Ehrlich. One of my students is there. He's going to try to answer some of these questions live. Um, okay. 
So let's continue this, this, let's continue this discussion. Um, Kobe, do you want me to? Or? Yeah, sure. You want to take okay. a stab at it? Go ahead. <laughs> so all we have is, is retrospective data from China, which is, it was published in Cell Metabolism in the work that you've done, that you've done there is, is very good. Uh, but it is limited to a certain population, a certain uh, perspective. They have seen that even mildly elevated, so we're talking around 250 uh, and 220, are, are at a higher, much higher risk of uh, death. And when we're talking about general risk of uh, deterioration, anything above 200 seems to be, uh, in, in measurement at the hospital, seems to be uh, more of a risk. So, yeah, I have to say, we will know more about these statistics in you know, years to come. Keep in mind that, you know, because SARS happened in 2000 and 2004, you know, we had 16 years to look at the data. Right now, nobody had any time to look at the data. So, you know, we had eight months and the data is still being developed. So, a lot of these are correlations. Um, and, and when you do correlations, sometimes you, you extract thousands and tens of thousands of patients. And sometimes what you have is dyslipidemia, yes or no, right? So you have a correlation to dyslipidemia and it's above, above a certain clinical threshold, but nobody knows exactly what is the relationship. Uh, so many of these studies are, you know, correlations. So we need to take that into account. Okay. So about three months ago, Avner, who you just heard, and I, uh, we started trying to figure out how we're going to study this um, in, 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 the coronav in the coronavirus. And, and the biggest problem we have is that we need the right model. If you're taking the virus, usually most studies, most works done to date are using cancer cells. So you can have lung cells, for example, that replicate very, very fast, uh, or you can have cells from a monkey. So vero cells from the kidney of a monkey, they replicate very fast too. And you can infect them with the virus and you can study a little bit about what the virus is doing to the cell. How does it go in? How does it come out? You know, how does it change the cells? Um, this is fine, but if you want to understand what the virus is doing to patients' lungs, this is not the right model. What you need to do is use lung cells. And lung cells are very, very different from cancer cells. And, and the metabolic signature is here is very different. So I'll try to explain what our cells are usually doing and then dig a little bit into what is happening with the virus. So our cells usually take glucose, this is sugar. They start burning it and some of this sugar becomes RNA. It's called the pentose phosphate pathway. And then you can burn this sugar into lactate this is what usually what your muscles are doing. And then the rest of the sugar that you don't burn into lactate goes into the mitochondria to generate energy. Okay? So most of our cells are doing that. Cancer cells do something slightly different. What they're doing is essentially their mitochondria, their engine is shut down. So they don't produce a lot of energy this way. They don't need a lot of oxygen. What they are doing is burning glucose as lactate and then generating excess as RNA, okay? So they're replicating, cancer cells are replicating very, very fast and essentially making a lot of lactate like they are muscle, ex exercising muscle, okay? So this is a great model to work with because it's very easy, but it gives you exactly the wrong results when you're trying to understand what the virus is doing in primary cells. So this is why we chose to focus on primary human lung cells and then try to validate everything we find in patient biopsies. Okay, so what do we see? So the first thing you do is you, you take cells, lung cells, right? Like they appear over here. And then you infect them with the virus and then you measure all of the RNA, all of the transcriptional changes induced by the virus. And then you're asking how many of these changes are actually metabolic? It turns out 
more than 60% of the changes induced by the virus are metabolic. And then about 20% of them seem to relate to lipid metabolism, fatty acids, cholesterol, phospholipids, etc. Okay? So there's a massive metabolic signature here. Think about it. The virus gets into the cell, right? It needs to replicate. It needs to move membranes around. It needs to create new RNA. It needs to evade the immune system. But it seems like 60% of what it's doing is lipid metabolism, you know, making fatty acids. So that was very surprising to us. And then we tried to ask exactly what is going on. So the first thing we see is a very strong signature of something called ER stress. What is ER? Um, our cells need to make protein. They need to make different proteins to function. So there is a membrane area in the cell that the cell is actually using to take the genetic material and turn it into new protein. Usually it's very nice and mild. It makes protein for everybody, including for the mitochondria, which is the engine. But once you have a virus going in, then the virus is going to start making his own protein and then things are going to, well, go haywire. And this is essentially what happens. So the ER stress is induced and then that leads to mitochondrial oxidative stress. So the engine stops working because suddenly all of the replacement parts starts disappearing because there's no more proteins to be had. Now, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk, I'm going to describe things in a very simple terms. And then if you're a scientist and you want to dig a little deeper, other than looking at our paper, you can also look at the pathway here on the left that is going to be more specific pathways that we found. Okay. Um, now, it's important to point out that ER stress um, is, is also a defense mechanism. So when the virus RNA suddenly shows up in the cytoplasm, when it's not supposed to be there, the cells can actually cause this stress to essentially slow down virus replication. But the side effect is that our engine suddenly doesn't have any more replacement parts and the mitochondria shuts down. Ooh, six questions. Okay, well, a lot of clinical questions. Um, let's continue on metabolism. So once the engine shuts down, what does the cell do? Well, the cell still needs to survive. So the first thing it does is take more glucose in. It takes more glucose, you take more carbohydrates in, and you generate energy by burning it into lactate like muscles. But this is not happening in muscle. This is happening in the lungs. The side effects of this is that glucose is also making a lot of RNA. So suddenly this increased glycolysis, this increased production or actually use of carbohydrates allows the virus to generate a lot more RNA for replication. And, and we see this in the genes, but we also see it in a metabolic function. You can actually see the cells becoming a lot more glycolic, and you can see that the mitochondria is shut down. Okay, so that's the engine being shut down and the cells are essentially consuming a lot more fuel. Now this might explain why people with hyperglycemia that have too much glucose in their blood, you know, are more predisposed to the disease. We don't really know, but it's an interesting uh, hypothesis here. The second part of this is lipid metabolism, essentially making fat. If you take in too much glucose and you don't burn all of it, then the excess glucose is gonna turn into fat, right? We know that from McDonald's. You're gonna make more fatty acids and you're gonna make more cholesterol. Well, it turns out these are two things the virus really, really wants. You see, the virus needs palmatic acid 
to anchor its spike protein. So it needs to make more fat. And the second thing the virus needs is a replication complex, essentially a factory to make more viruses. So both these pathways are very, very important for the virus. And this is part of the genetic signature that we see. Now it's not only a genetic signature. We got the lung cells that are infected with the virus and essentially stained them and looked under the microscope to see what these lung cells are doing. And you can see here two very different types of stains. The top one is a glucose tracer. Okay, so cells that take more carbohydrates will have a lot more green in their cytoplasm, so inside them. And you can see that once you infect lung cells with the virus, suddenly they fill up with glucose. Second stain is for lipids and phospholipids. Now, these are not, you know, fat is not something that you should be storing in your lungs. Uh, these are not fat cells. These are lung cells. They're supposed to be flat, right? And you can see what happens when you infect them with the virus. Suddenly, all these membranes, all these lipids show up. And it's a massive amount. Let's see. Um, there is a, an interesting point here. Okay, your cells are taking, are making fat. Uh, sorry, your cells are making fat. So what? We can burn fat, right? Our body burns fat all the time. It's called lipid oxidation. You know, we can actually take fatty acids and burn it and make, you know, ketone bodies or burn it to energy. Well, it seems like, well, the virus fought, you know, I'm using parentheses, air parentheses here, air quotes, um, thought about this as well. If you look at the metabolic pathways, you see that even though the virus caused the cells to increase fatty acids and cholesterol synthesis, at the same time, it shut down the ability of the lung cells to burn fat. Well, lung cells burn fat by activating PPR alpha. It's a nuclear receptor. It's a protein that sits on the DNA and controls all of the genes that, that, that lead to lipid oxidation. And that transcription factor, that mega controller, that switch that allows us to burn fat is shut down in infection. We don't really know exactly how the virus is doing it. Um, so that's why the cells, the lung cells cannot burn down fat. Okay. So so this is an interesting pathway. What can we do about it? So there are potential modulators of these very specific pathways. And, and we know some of them, right? So for example, if your problem is too much glucose, well, there are drugs, you know, there's drug against Parkinson and another one with a cough suppressant. Both of them can potentially block glucose absorption in the lungs, right? So you can try to block carbohydrates absorption to the lungs. If your problem is that the mitochondria, the engine is shut down, you can potentially bring it back up, right? So drugs like metformin can sometimes activate the mitochondria. If our problem is ear stress, well, there are some drugs that can actually alleviate ear stress. Okay, if, if we think the problem is cholesterol, and I have to say, we don't. We don't think the problem is cholesterol, but still. 
if we think the problem is cholesterol, then statins, like simvastatin and pravastatin, might be able to essentially block this pathway. Okay? And if we think the problem is that the cells can't shut down, the, the, the virus shuts down fatty acid oxidation, we can induce these very specific pathways with another family of drugs called fibroids. And there are a bunch of them. So we did some of these tests and what we saw is that out of all these, femifibrate, or essentially the fibrate family of drugs, seems to be very, very effective at shutting down virus production. So here on the right, you can actually see, again, lung cells that are filled with lipids. These are all the red stains that you see. These are all the lipid membranes that are here. And when you give these cells phenofibrate, you see all the red stains disappear and become these tiny, tiny, you know, green specks. This is an indication that the lung cells started burning down the fat. And when you look at the virus being produced, you can actually see that it gets almost completely shut down. So it's uh, about, a, about 100 times lower than all the other drugs that we tested. 100 times lower, and you can actually see that it actually goes down. Now, this is happening at 20 micromolar. This is a dose of fibrate that we think is, uh, th that we actually see it in the body in a, when you take a high dose of fenofiber. So when you take about 100, 160 milligrams, that's roughly what you see. About 20 micromolar is your C-max. So, so this is a reasonable amount of fenofiber. And this is very different from what other groups have found for statins. So statins are found in the blood in a relatively very low concentration, tens of nanomolars. They can block the virus replication, right? The pathway is right here. This is cholesterol production. The problem is that you need a concentration that is about 10 times more than you give to patients. And in that concentration, you're going to get more damage because of statins. So we don't think statins are going to work here. Um, so it's important to point that out. So this is, in, this is the end of our study. And, and this is where you know, we, are, we are slowly progressing from here. There are a couple of interesting anecdotes I would like to point out. So one, phenofibrate is a relatively old drug. It has been approved in 1975 by the FDA to treat this dyslipidemia, actually hypertroglycinemia. So when your triglycerides level in the blood are too, are, are, are too high. Uh, it's a generic medication. It has a lot of different names. One of them is Trichor or Phenoglide, Lipofen. There are a lot of different formulations of the same drug. Um, it is counterindicated for patients that have kidney dysfunction, liver, gallbladder disease, or patients that are nursing, for obvious reasons. You don't want to mess with that. And there are a lot of different types of drugs available in both in Israel and the United States. Um, one, one point, you know, it, 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 not a lot of people are using it. And the reason a lot of people are not using it is because um, it has been replaced by statins. And it's important to try to understand why. Fibroids are an excellent drug and they do exactly what they're designed to do, lower your triglycerides level. It's just that they don't lower your cardiovascular event risk that well. You know, LDL or high cholesterol is only one risk factor in cardiovascular disease. Statins reduce your cholesterol levels, but they're also a very powerful anti-inflammatory drug. So statins are actually better at reducing cardiovascular events. So in a general population uh, that have high cholesterol, it's better to give them statins. And this is essentially what happened, okay? So fiber is faded out. That doesn't mean that they're not a good drug. They're an excellent drug. Um, it's just that usually what you're trying to deal with is cardiovascular problems because that's what the majority of the people you know, in the Western world are dying from. Um, 
even though it's a small population, we can still look and see how did this patient population do um, in COVID-19. And, and we have some data in Israel, but it's still very preliminary. So keep that in mind. Um, the percent of people taking fibroids in the Israeli population is about 1.6. If you look at people that are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there is no difference between people that took fibroids or not took fibroids, right? This drug does not protect against the virus infection. It's not supposed to, right? We're only talking about the, what, what is caused by the virus, not by you know, being infected or not. But what we see is a lot less patients showing up in hospitals and in ICUs across Israel. Even though, like we said before, this drug is used to treat dyslipidemia and is usually given to people that are over 50. These are two major risk factors for COVID-19. So we are supposed to get a lot more patients with fibroids in Israeli hospitals, but we get less. Uh, we, we seem to be getting anywhere from 0 0.7 to 0 0.3. Um, Israel does not have fenofibrate. We have uh, ciprofibrate and bezofibrate, two drugs that are doing something slightly different, but they're still fibrate, so they still activate PPL alpha, and they still reduce triglycerides. Um, but there seems to be some correlation here that we are, you know, trying to explore more and setting up the right clinical study. So this is where I'll stop. Um, and this work was, was carried out by Avner Ehrlich, who you heard, and is also trying to answer some of your questions right now live. Uh, my uh, postdoc, Konstantinos uh, Ioannidis, and Dr. Omar Cohen, who is my lab manager, and it's been done with the support of the European Research Council and the technical support of Mount Sinai. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kobe. We have quite a few questions, uh, and I'd like to let a few people ask them live. Uh, I will start with uh, Nili Sikorsky, because she had two interesting questions. Nili, would you like to ask? Um, Nili, I'm allowing you to unmute if you'd like to ask. Okay, I will read Nili's question. Uh, he asks, how and why does remdesivir work? And she also asks, uh, from your point of view, are the mRNA-based vaccines likely to work better than inactivated virus vaccines? <sighs> Okay, so remdesivir is an antiviral that, as far as I remember, uh, targets the virus polymerase. Um, essentially, the virus polymerase is part of the virus proteins that, essentially, that, that, that makes new RNA. Uh, and, and some of the best drugs that we have for HIV and HCV actually target those. Um, it was originally... It was identified for other viruses, and it seems to be work. It seems to to work really well here. Um, to tell you the truth, I'm I'm not 100% certain that that this severe mechanism of action has been fully delineated. There is a lot of things that it could be doing as well. Um, and I can see Rina here. Hi, Rina. Um, we're talking about the the vaccine. Let's talk about the vaccines, uh, passive vaccines, active vaccines, RNA vaccines, and so forth. Uh, there is no doubt that vaccines are needed. Um, we have been a little lax as a civilization uh, after the SARS and the MERS epidemics. Um, there, are, there were some vaccines in development, and if we had funded them enough, then we wouldn't be in this situation today. Uh, we would have a vaccine that we could just mildly change and, um, and, and then uh, protect at least the, uh, the elderly or the, the, the high-risk population. Uh, 
the passive vaccine seems to be working, but you know, we're not going to bleed patients all the time uh, to protect another patient. So that's not going to work. Um, active vaccine, uh, in the, the idea of you know, using a vaccine here, you know, there's going to be a vaccine at some point generated. Um, after the first vaccine is generated, I'm sure there's going to be another family of vaccines that is going to have significant less side effects from the vaccines as we're hearing about it now because some of the side effects are very extreme. Um, there is, people are talking about, you know, both an antigen and a T memory response for a vaccine that might be able to last slightly longer than a few months. Uh, everything is very promising. Every, everything is still preliminary. I hope that there's gonna be something for the next winter. It's probably not gonna be this winter. That's, a big problem. I hope that I answered. I know that it was a little bit rambling because there's just it's it's too big topic to unravel right now. Okay, Kobe. Another question that I received from a few of the participants to do with the relevance of type O blood and if this has any effect touching COVID nineteen virus. You know, as human beings, we like to see correlations, um, and, and and people have been correlating their blood type with what they should be eating and what they should be doing, and um, I don't see any, um, I don't see any correlation, and I don't think I've seen any any significant paper in a respectable journal that has that has talked about that correlation. Uh, I might have missed it, but I doubt that it's there. Uh, blood type is a specific antigen, uh, and it has little to do with your immune system or your lung cells. Thanks, Kobe. We, we have a few more questions that are outstanding in the q and I'm hoping that uh, you or your research assistant will have the opportunity to them, but I do want to give uh, Rena the floor. We Thank were you. hoping that able to join us. Thank you. So happy to see you, Rena. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do apologize to everybody <clears throat> for the technical snafu. Even though I do an average of at least two programs a day, uh, it happens sometimes. Thank goodness, not very often. But we just heard a very enlightening and informative uh, presentation by my favorite professor. Uh, to me and my family, Professor Kobe is not just a brilliant scientist, but a good friend. From our first meeting some years ago at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, we were so impressed with him his passion for research, and his warmth. My late husband, Samuel, of blessed memory, and I feel so privileged to be part of the Hebrew University family and to be able, in some small measure, to contribute to Professor Nehemiah's endeavors. One can really judge a man, a man's character, when he's not just a friend in happy times, but also during time of sadness. When Professor Kobe, that's how I like to call him, walked into our home during the Shiva period for my husband, I and my family were so deeply touched by his kindness, by his caring, and I will always be grateful to him for the time that he spent with us. This is a true testament of a real mensch. And I want you to know, Kobe, that all our children are tuned in and listening to you. So thank you so much for being who you are, this brilliant man, and for being a friend. Thank you again. Uh, thank you so much, Rena. That was a beautiful way to close our evening. 
I want to thank everyone, especially Kobe, for sharing his insights with us and, and to be with us today. And we hope to see you at our next webinar, which will be in September. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Do, do you want to leave the, the floor a little bit open for, you know, we'll, we'll see what I can do with, uh, with the answers. Um, uh, absolutely. I know we still have a lot of questions out there. Uh, I would ask everyone to put them in the Q&A. And that way, be easy to respond to all of them, either in writing or verbally. Okay. Um, so let's, let's see, um, Joshua Tenbaum asked about the bempedonic acid, you know, blocking citrate and mevalonate pathways. Uh, so this is, this is going to work very similar to, to statins. Um, I'm, I'm worried about side effects and I'm worried about what concentration you need to see to use to, to actually block that. Uh, there are advantages of targeting nuclear receptors like PPR alpha. You usually need a relatively low concentrations or, or you don't really have a major side effects other than that. What do I think about the Russian vaccine? Seriously. <laughs> I have no idea what I think about the Russian vaccine. I don't know what the Russians are thinking about the Russian vaccine. Um, so we state that Monica, hey Monica, uh, phenofiber does not cure the virus, but it does mitigate the symptoms. Um, yeah, I think the, the biggest problems with COVID-19 is the symptoms, right? Uh, if, 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 if the symptoms were not that severe, it would be a common cold. Um, it's not a drug like HCV or HIV that causes a chronic infection. We can actually clear it. We clear it in two weeks. The only question is, do we die in the process of clearing it or not? So if we can actually suppress those symptoms, um, that would be a major, that would be a major uh, uh, move forward. Why aren't there more clinical studies on two protease inhibitors that showed in vitro activity preventing COV-2 from entering the cells? So right now, clinical, study, clinical studies are booked. Every single company on earth that thinks they have something relating to the virus is trying to get patients for, COVID, for, for, for this study. Um, and hospitals are very, very uh, careful about what studies they approve and what studies are not. First of all, it costs about half a million dollars to run even a simple study. And then usually they demand some animal experiments from you. So, so, if, you, so if the animal experiments are there, you know, people might try them. Uh, and even then they might be online. You know, in Israel, it's, it's, it's a little crazy. There's, for every patient, there's at least two studies two, three studies that are, you know, trying to get him. Uh, so, okay, Haspel. Heard there is one mechanism in which the body can fight the virus, that infected cells can signal other cells that there is a virus. Yes, it's, it's actually called interferon signaling. When, when cells become infected, they can release interferon, which a recent clinical study showed it very effective and actually signal other cells to start chopping down the virus RNA. Uh, it's, part, it's part of what we call an innate immune response. Uh, do we know what is the phenofibrate concentration in lung cells in humans? Um, it, it's not supposed to arrive to the lung cells, it's supposed to arrive to the lungs, and we actually don't know what is the distribution there. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to do in, in animal experiments because rodents don't really respond to it. Okay. Long-term effects in COVID-19, not fully recovering and the chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. So, 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 so Marlene, yeah, this is the part of the problem. It seems like COVID-19 has a lot of side effects that are still underappreciated. Um, and I'm wondering what, you know, uh, specific treatments like phenofibrites can do to ameliorate that in the long term. So, you know, if you're shutting down PPR alpha in general, that's not going to be good for your body. Um, okay. 
how his gums are doing. Rony Gums is doing well. You know, it's about time we have a, a, a real professional handling it in Israel. Um, are, are children more resilient to the coronavirus? So, so exactly what do you mean by resilience? This is something that, you know, people in the media are all, all, all confused about that. The virus doesn't care what lungs it, it infects. Um, and, and children get infected at, I'm going to say something that is probably wrong. People, children are infected at roughly the same rates as, as, as adults. So it's not, an, it's not uh, an issue of infected or not infected. It's just that the vast majority of children don't develop any syndromes, any symptoms, right? And they usually clear the virus very, very fast. So, uh, you know, it might last for a few days. They might have a sore throat, might cough for a day, and that's about it. Um, why well, there is there is uh, something that is worth to mention here. So children are less or develop less innate immune uh, disease or response, and you have less cytokines, and they have been shown to have less increase in ACE receptor uh, and and overall. So they are probably as likely to catch it, but not as likely to be able to infect as many cells in it. So in that regard, it was shown that kids under a certain age are, are less infectious, uh, not, not infected, but less, but less infectious outside. And then uh, obviously there are all the indications with, uh, with the disease severity. Yeah, just that, uh, so I tend to agree, just that I, I'm not sure whether they're less infectious because they clear the virus faster or that they have, you know, per day, less viral particles. And I'm not 100% certain. And yeah, a little bit more, a little bit of immune privilege usually go, goes a long way. So uh, slightly less inflammatory conditions in children probably leads to less symptoms. I'm not 100% certain that's the case. So my working hypothesis right now, and it's completely an hypothesis, I have zero to back it up, is that the virus causes lipid accumulation and that causes the, the release of inflammatory, of inflammatory mediators that ignite the immune system to, in the first place. So if, if children's metabolism is faster, if they have naturally more PPR alpha, if their mitochondria are more abundant, if they're used to dealing with lipids very, very fast, well, they might not develop this lipid accumulation that, that much. And then they might not activate their immune system to begin with, even if they are, if they are, even if their immune system is already uh, uh, less likely to 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 cause a cytokine storm. But we again, we don't really know. Uh, I don't know, but did you I don't know, did you see this question about pregnant women and 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 COVID nineteen? Yeah. So at least the data that is out right now. So again, we're talking about statistics and numbers. So patient, uh, patients in, in various uh, stages of pregnancy seem to be, well, more likely to be hospitalized um, and then a much higher risk for getting into the ICU. So we're talking about, um, well, about 15 to 20% increase against known pregnant women. Um, so regarding children, how does it pass? And the fetus, there is, there is still very limited data because we are talking about, so it's not a Zika virus that you have abnormalities in birth. So we don't really know, and, and most of the people don't really know yet how this effect is gonna last throughout and if the baby itself has any changes, but something we'll probably know in, in two or three years rather than right now where the babies are, are still very young and there's hard to see any changes. They don't get another arm or anesophilysis or anything that was shown with Zika, but we really don't know yet. There's not enough data. Yep. Okay. Any other question? I think, I think we answered all of them. Yay. Okay.
Well, with anxiety, I think it's the only one that's still out there. So anxiety is known to be stress well, contributing to yeah, stress and, and the stress itself is contributing to overall stress in the body. There is indication that people in, with anxiety has higher, uh, higher stress in general and stress markers and, and you need immune responses and cytokines. But again, there's not enough data yet. I don't think I've seen anyone does a, a worthwhile correlation or a worthwhile study that touches that. Yeah, okay, Todd is asking, what percentage of those infected with COVID-19 are showing detrimental health effects we mentioned before? We don't know. Um, but for SARS, it was, you know, an extra 40% of the general population. So, um, you know, it, it, it increased from, you know, 4% to something like 49 or 50%. Um, more risk of becoming ill, more risk of, of developing cardiovascular disease, more risk of, you know, dyslipidemia. Um, we don't really know how this will pan out. You know, my guess it will, we'll see it roughly the same way as, as, as SARS. Yeah, so right now, most of them are case studies, which is essentially I've seen three or four patients like this, and it's accumulating. But until someone takes a, a bunch of data from recovered patients and do, do like do a proper follow-up after them, which is well, not the interest of everyone right now because we're talking about the interest is where the patients are and not afterwards, but yeah. Yeah, we, we don't know. Well, I think that we're going to close things up now and let everybody get to the nightly news because there have been some really interesting developments that are not scientific necessarily today. And I want to once again thank Kobe so much for making the time and sharing this with us. We've been reading about it for weeks and it's so exciting to hear it from you, Kobe. Thanks so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks, La Laura. Thanks, Rina. I really appreciate everything. Laila Tov. Shalom. Laila.